Welcome to this episode of the Limitation is a Mirage podcast. Today I have a special guest, Gary Jackson from Gary Jackson's Barbers. Uh, we're going to talk about beards because we both have beards. Mine was glorious until Gary actually came on the shot and I was like, I'm a wee bit behind. Uh, and a bit of positivity because I know you, <laughs> I can't even do that. <laughs> I, could, I could fake it, but nearly. Uh, so my thinking, I, I've heard about you from D. Graham, who uh, that's where I get all my suits from. Um, just over the years, we've been talking about different people and you've come up a lot and then you've done a bit of work with D as well. Uh, so I thought I'd reach out to you and ask you to come on board. Um, do you want to give a brief, int brief introduction to yourself, to the audience of yourself as well? I think I hit it. You're a barber. That's super fantastic barber. So for anyone that doesn't know you. Okay, Liam. I am Gary Jackson. How you doing, folks? I do hope you're all keeping well. And I am the proprietor of Gary's Barbershop in the Hollywood High Street. Uh, we have been there doing our thing since November 1989. So we started off as the, the new kids on the block and now we're the, the old boys. So we have uh, pre-COVID, we had a team of seven of us. Uh, cool. we're, pretty much, we're, we're pretty much down now to a team of six. Um, we have tried uh, to, to do the right thing during COVID. We've behaved ourselves. We haven't been naughty and cut anybody's hair and we've stuck to it pretty religiously. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Old Town Barber, who five, six years ago went to a barber and networking event. Yes, there is such a thing. And I totally got my eyes opened to how businesses work in the, in the modern world. I was accosted with, there was about 5,000 barbers there. Over <laughs> This was over in the Celtic Manor, which some people may know from the golf. Beautiful hotel complex over in Cardiff. And uh, myself and my wife went along, not knowing what to expect. And I was just totally bowled over with uh, the buzz and the excitement and the whole, um, the whole networking that goes on at these events, which I was oblivious to. So, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So you were kind of doing the general Northern Irish thing where we just work and we stay in our own box. And then all of a sudden you, you creep out of it and you see there's a whole world going on around you. Different people with the same experiences and different different people with the same ideas and love for what you do. So but what, I did, what I did, I knew that... that the whole world of barbering was out there but what I didn't realise was that they were all focusing on their brands and they were all networking network, with each other literally all around the world barbers yeah. from Holland and barbers from Brazil and, and I didn't realise that there was all this barber love uh, if you google the word barber or old school barber or on a google ranking you'd be absolutely amazed the world of barbering has gone absolutely ballistic in the last sort of five to 10 years. And I, I wasn't privy to it. Uh, I, I wasn't part of this. And then I discovered it. And like, I was an old hand, as I say, I'd been, yeah. when I first went over there, I mean, I was 25, 26, 27 years into my barbering career. And I just thought, right, I'm gonna have as much fun with this <laughs> as is humanly possible. I, I this was great crack, Leo. That just the, the camaraderie and, and the banter and the, and everybody has their own angles and their own you know their own different marketing processes and it was fascinating. It was a real epiphany, a real eye opener. What's brilliant is how passionate you talk about it. Like I, I love being around passionate people and like you're so passionate about what you talk about it. And you did what lots of people wouldn't do in your situation. You came, as you said, as an old hat, as an old hand, and embraced it you embraced the the network and the camaraderie you embraced the market and you embraced obviously from your top you embraced the brand and everything whereas a lot of other people will go that's just not how i do it they'll just go back to so do you, is it something that's just in you that you want to grow and and be better all the time or no i i've sort of come to a time in my life you know that uh i have had a wonderful career 
in Barber. And Barber to me is very much, uh, the barber shop is very much the, the hub or the center of most communities. It's a, it's a safe space where guys can come and most importantly, feel comfortable. They yeah. get a good haircut, they feel better about themselves. Maybe they're getting the haircut for a job interview. Maybe they're getting their haircut for a big date that they're going on. Maybe it's their wedding haircut. But essentially after, like we've had our business now in Hollywood for about 33 years. And uh, I, I've worked there all that time. So some of my staff have been with me for maybe 15, 16 years. So That's brilliant. We are on our third generation of customers. The men yeah. who first... The men who first came to us 33 years ago, bringing in their wee toddlers to get a haircut. Well, those toddlers are, are fully grown men now and they're bringing in their wee toddlers. We probably know maybe 75, 80 percent of, uh, of our customers by their, by their first names. You know, we, we, probably, we probably know more about these people than what we do about some of our own families, you know, because we're in just constant constant connection with these people yeah so what i didn't realize i mean i've always had that in the barbershop but what i didn't realize was because of digital because of social media and other platforms and big networking events that, that you were able to reach out you were still a community barber but you were able to reach out to other community barbers literally all over the world and uh this was this was a revelation to me. I didn't know that this world existed, yeah. and I just thought, at my time of life, I'm going to have as much fun with this as is humanly possible, and at the same time, promote our brand. You know, the Gary's Barbershop brand. Uh, it's now quite a well-known brand, sort of in local circles and in sort of Northern Ireland, and perhaps even maybe a bit further afield. You know, and all all we do is just essentially is have a bit of crack in. Yeah. It's the way, the way you talk about it, just it shines through that you, you love what you do, but the fact that you're like, you're saying you're three generations deep in, in, in clients and customers, like obviously how they have such trust and comfort within and being around you that they're happy to go like the bring. I, I can just imagine them saying to their wee kid, you know, this is the man that cut my hair whenever I was your age. And now he's going to do this. And like, I just think that's amazing, and the community you, you're just you're talking about being a community barber. Now you've just opened up your your community. Now has become the world, but Absolutely. and the fact that you're bringing such passion and excitement into that world is is unreal. So what one, one of the things I was thinking about before we chatted was, I, obviously from my hair, I haven't been to a barber for a long time. I. I, I, there's not, I ended up shaving my own head. I used to have long hair to my neck and I shaved it I, because I loved martial arts. I shaved it into an old school Kung Fu ponytail, like wet shaved. And then like my head punished me and my hair never grew back. I just went bald from there and I just refused to come back. So whenever my sisters and all would have went to the barbers, they talk about all the stuff that goes on or not the barbers, sorry, the hairdressers. They would talk about being at the hairdresser and how, they come back and it always took a long time. I've been asking them, like, what do you talk about? Or, and it seems like a bit of a therapy thing. Do you think now that people like males are more open to, I don't know how to word it other than the therapy side of Barbara. And like we come in and sit down and when you sit in that chair, you're, you're making them feel better by physically changing their look. But I imagine with what you talk about and the fact that you said, you know, them more, do you think men are more open to that now? They're the stigma of chatting about, ourselves and how we feel is starting to go away well i think genuinely that the barbershop has always been you know it's that old adage sometimes it's easier to talk to a stranger than what it is to talk to one of your your nearest and your dearest i mean what i said a minute or two ago was that i probably know 75 percent of my customers by their first name but i don't yeah. know their sur i don't know their surnames yeah. I don't know where they live. I don't know. But we have a sign in our in our shop that says what goes to the barbershop stays in the barbershop. And it's very much a safe space where guys do 
they feel comfortable with you. They've been coming to you for years and they'll, they'll have a bit of banter with you. But you do hear, a lot of the times you do hear their innermost thoughts. Mm. And um, you do hear about their illnesses and you do hear about their relationships and you do hear about, you just hear stuff that, uh, as I say, they know that it won't ever be repeated and to any other, you know. Yeah. And, you know, it is it is very much uh, a safe space. Are guys easier than I opening up more? I think they genuinely are. I do honestly believe that um, that they are that they, they do feel a bit more comfortable now about talking about important issues, especially their health. You know. Yeah, and then to have someone like you around them that isn't going to shy away. You don't you don't seem like someone that would shy at something that they say or even if you don't have specific advice, you would have wisdom from your years of like, we don't give advice. Yeah. You know, it's not like, but it's non judgmental and it's just somewhere where men feel as if they can, and the teenagers as well, you know, a lot of the, the, the teenagers were with all that teenage acts going on and all the stress going on about, about uh, you know doing their exams and everything, you, you do get quite a few of the teenagers that would talk to you, and they they, they see it they see it as very much uh, you know a, a, an easier thing to do for them. Yeah, I suppose they're getting distracted. I'm just thinking from a therapist point of view, because they're distracted. There's a bit of distraction there with you cutting the hair and you doing the job that you're there to do that they can loosen up a wee bit more and it's not like you're analyzing them because you're you're analyzing their hair or you're fixing their beard or whatever so they're more more relaxed than that uh how did you actually get into barbering because i imagine i i could be completely wrong but whenever you're getting in you're not thinking i'm gonna get in i'm gonna become great at cutting hair and, and beards and sorting out styles and also i'm gonna be a very good listening ear like... well what happened to me was i um I'm an old punk, you know. So back in the in the seventies, I'd have been around about. And the whole ethos of punk was very much DIY. <laughs> I mean, we, we never had a huge amount of money, but you know, I would have um, I would have cut my own hair a fair bit, you know, with all the Mohicans and all the the spiky hairdos and and uh, my mates. I would have cut quite a few of my mates' hair, you know, just. Didn't know what I was doing, but just sort of made it up as I went along. And uh, so there was always that sort of hands-on approach, but I never really saw it as a career option. But long story short, I left North. I couldn't wait to get out of Northern Ireland when I was about 19. Back then, at the beginning of the 80s, Northern Ireland probably wasn't a, a, a particularly nice place. Yeah. Uh, but for me, the big deal for me was myself and my mates, we were all big into our music. We were listening to John Peel and we were going to Good Vibrations Record Shop and ban all our tunes. But we couldn't get to hear any of the bands live because bands didn't come to Belfast then. They didn't come yeah. to Northern. They didn't come to Northern Ireland. So plus there was three million people unemployed across the country and it, it wasn't a, a great time economically or you didn't have a lot of opportunities so I couldn't wait to get out and go to London and all my mates all went to London as well and we had the time of our lives because we were just surrounded with all this wonderful music so another long story short I did decide to come back to Northern Ireland and I returned home in about 1987 and that's when I chose to come and live in Hollywood because uh, Hollywood is a very harmonious place and it's close to the sea and it's easy to get into Belfast. And for me, it was just an ideal place to, to, to come back to live in when I came back home. But uh, I had done bar work when I lived in London. I worked behind a bar and it was the most wonderful education that anybody could have ever got in their life because... Yeah. You know, when I was 18, 19 years old from Belfast, we were quite a quite an insular sort of community by and large. 
and you go off to the bright lights of London and you meet all the different nationalities under the sun and yeah. you learn an awful lot more about Irish people as well, believe it or not, because, um, you know, maybe you wouldn't have had a huge amount of contact with people from the, the four corners of Ireland, you know. So uh, you met everybody when you were over in London and it was a great education and it very much gave me a great insight into uh, just my fellow, my fellow man, if, for want of a better expression. So it's already educated me in life a good bit. So whenever I came back home anyway, the job opportunities still weren't very uh, forthcoming. So I didn't know what, it was that bit of a loose end. I couldn't really, um, I, couldn't, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, if truth be told. But I was in the barber shop one day, I was in a wee barber shop called Zach's which was opposite Botanic Train Station. You went down to, it was an old traditional barber's and the guy who owned it passed away. And then these young bloods from Zach's, which was a very famous hairdressers in Great Victoria Street, Bradbury Place. They took it over as a standalone barber shop. So I was in there one day anyway, getting a haircut. I was just sitting, soaking up the vibe and the crack was good. And Saturday afternoon, plenty of bomber. And I was just, I had another wee bit of an epiphany. I had another light bulb moment. I just thought, I could do this. So that was, I, I knew the guy who, who worked there. Uh, he drank in laveries. At, at, at that time, everybody would have, would have went to laveries for the, the back bar for a drink. So I asked him, I said, any, any chance of, of teaching me how to cut hair? So he said, well, look, we don't have a job for you. But if you come along on your day off from work, keep your job come along on your day off from work every week and bring somebody with you, like your brother or one of your mates. He says, I'll talk you through cutting hair. So I sort of pretty much fell into it by intuition or accident or whatever you want to call it. And I've never regretted it. I've loved every minute of it ever since. I you can see when you talk about it that you just love the whole experience. I love the fact that you you have all these wee light bulb moments and you're jumping on them. You want to, You love the music. So you thought, thought to yourself, well, how do I get more music? Move to London. Then when you're in London, you did what you did. You came home. And then the same thing, you're just watching people and thinking, I can do that. That's kind of my whole, like I go, my, it says on my top, the prove it guy. Like I, I love doing anything. I'm a yes man. Could you do that? Yeah. And then I'll go try to work it out later. The more I, I've experienced that in my life, the more fulfilled I feel my life has become. And just listening to someone that's a few years down the path from me, you sound like you've done the same thing, like you're sitting surrounded in a barbershop and you're going, I could do this. Whereas there's loads of people that would go, I could probably do that. But they'll just go back about their normal day then where you actually took charge and did something about it. The funny thing is that, you know, I actually put up a Facebook Facebook post recently on our, our, our barbershop, Gary's Barbershop, we'd have, uh, you know, with over 11,000 people who follow our Facebook page. So for a small independent barbers in Hollywood, County Town, it's quite a large sort of a, a follower. But I actually put up a post recently about uh, several times in my life I've had these light bulb, or light bulb moments. Uh, I, I'm the youngest in our family. I have two older brothers and an older sister, and they were all mad about music. So when I was a kid, they would have been sort of young teenagers but they were big into the Beatles and the Stones. And so I grew up never having the, never remembering the television on in my house. It was always just, it was always just music, music, music. But I do remember watching Top of the Pops when I was about nine years old. And in those days, everybody watched Top of the Pops. It was a family occasion. <laughs> Mom, dad, brothers, sisters, they'd all sit and watch. And uh, usually your mum and dad would slag off whatever was, well, it's not as good as what it was in our day, you know. But yeah. I distinctively remember when I was about nine years old and David Bowie came on singing Starman. And I just yeah. remember, th I just remember thinking at that moment, yeah, I, I want to be in his gang. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So I, I, this Facebook post that I put up recently, I have gone with my gut instinct. On, on quite a few occasions, sort of, if it, see, if it feels right, you know, just do it. Whenever I met my wife, uh, we, 
we uh, we went on it. Funny enough, yesterday, Valentine's Day, was the anniversary of our first date, 32 years ago. So within six weeks of that first date, I'd actually proposed to her because I just knew that she, yeah. was the right, she was the right person, you know? That was quite an exciting year for you because if I'm doing my math right, that's around about whenever you started being a barber, around about getting married, everything, like it all sort of... No, well, I was a barber before I met. I was a barber before I met my wife. I'd been a barber by that stage a couple of years. And we used to go out. I, I used to bump into her like, walking my dog on the beach at Hollywood, you know? Yeah. And we would sort of just ex exchange pleasantries, you know? How you doing today? You all right? You all right? Uh, and then, long story short, a while after that, we went on our first date. And within six weeks, I'd asked the girl to marry me, you know? So, yes, it was a very exciting time. There was a lot of good stuff going on. Uh, whenever my wife and I first met, um, I was working for another guy. Uh, then within a couple of years of getting married, I'd sort of opened my own, my own place. And, uh, yeah, good, good times. But, yeah, gut instinct, gut instinct, going with your gut, you know. If it feels right, just, 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 uh, just do it. Do you think that's why you're you're so positive and passionate about what you do because like you're led by yourself mostly like you, you're from this conversation whatever whatever you get involved in you you listen to yourself you're self-aware and you go that i think that'll be good for me there's probably other things that you did that and then you went actually now that i've done this for a wee while it's not i'll just move on but because you're you're connected to yourself and your gut regrets don't personally for me i don't regret anything because i i at that time it felt like what i should do so i think most people miss out on that those sort of life experiences because they're afraid of being wrong afraid of failure afraid of looking stupid or whatever do you notice that around the people that you you whenever you're talking to these people and people are being more open do you think that the thing that holds them back most is themselves or like am i completely off the path here oh you, you do talk to people and they do have a lot of regrets you know i i'm very very fortunate that i don't have really any regrets yeah that's uh, what i was thinking would happen because you're the same as myself you you go on your gut so it's hard to regret it when you believed at the time that it was the best thing to do well certainly opening my business was probably one of the best things i ever done and you know marrying my wife was probably I, I would have to say that was the best thing that I ever did. <laughs> so the major, like, I mean, I've made an awful lot of mistakes. Of course I have. I'm not saying that I get it right. But, uh, you know, whenever you do make mistakes, you sort of have the, the tools to sort of do them. And you put it down the experience and you, you learn from your mistakes. But certainly the big life decisions that I've made, I don't really regret any of those, you know. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, it's so, something that I would talk with clients and different people that I interact with. I would say that like most of the people that, are, that deal with regret deal with regret because they didn't do what they thought they should have done. So if you just keep doing whatever you want to do, keep trying things. Are you, you know, a, are you a, a psychotherapist or a counselor, Liam? Or? Uh, I, my background's in hypnotherapy amongst other things, but um, at the minute I'm mostly work with businessmen to help improve their physical, mental, emotional well-being to be better businessmen. And then I go in and do the same thing for a company. So that's where, where, what I do. But my background is in, like when I met Dee Graham, it was through, I was doing magic and doing wedding gigs as a magician and then doing public talks and, and mixing up the magic with the motivational type stuff. So m my goal is really, I believe in, I love superheroes and I believe that everyone can become superhuman. So I love being around people that are passionate and that are chasing your goals. So in my eyes, you would be a superhuman barber. Like if you took me and you, there'd be such a massive difference between our abilities, which I'm going to get into soon because I'm just going to pick your brain on how to have a more glorious beard. <laughs> but even if, I, if there's so many barbers out there, that would be content and happy and just their lane. Whereas you don't seem like that. You seem like you want to grow. You want to interact. I suppose that brings up the background now. We're, we're like it's getting, it's getting back again to having as much fun as possible. <laughs> yeah. And that's, 
that that is the you know that is the the two things that I'm most passionate about apart from my good lady wife. Two things that I'm most passionate about is uh, our barber shop and our customers and music. So um, you know it has given me the opportunity to combine the two. We would have bands playing in our shop and my wife organized, or we organized the festival uh, for five years. We didn't do it this year, thank goodness. We hadn't it scheduled this year, thank goodness we hadn't. Yeah. It would normally be in June each year, but we did it June last year. And so we've been running a festival for five years in Hollywood. And that all came off the back of my wife suggested to me, she said, do you think we could get 400 people for the Alabama Three? You know, the guys that do the the, the Sopranos theme tune, woke up this uh, morning. Yeah. yeah. So it all started with that. I thought, well, 400 people, that should be easy enough. You know, even if we invite all our mates and put the <laughs> word out. And so it, it, that sort of came off the back of positive thinking as well. And, but um, a big part of it, what I would say is I was... This is something else that I've talked about on our social media. So uh, a year and a half or so ago there, I was uh, diagnosed with ADHD. So that is something that I've spoken about as well. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, ADHD is both a blessing and a curse. And as you get older, you learn to channel it and you learn to just sort of, it, it can be your superpower. Yeah, you know, if it's channeled in the right way, and it's very difficult when you're a younger mom because you tend to be very impetuous and you tend to do a lot of uh, things maybe without thinking about them, without thinking it through. But as you get older and you recognise the traits and you become you become sort of more aware, um, ADHD can't be can't be a superpower. Yeah. So. I love that idea. I've wor worked with different children with different types of ADHD and, and different adults as well. And I used to explain to them that if this was way back when, in the olden days, you'd be the hunter, you'd be the warrior, you'd be the one that's more alert, it's more switched on, that's designed to go out and do what needs to be done to sur keep everyone surviving. But then when there's nothing to hunt or, or no wars to fight, they get bored easy. And they start mm. to do stuff without thinking. So that was always my analogy of, of how, and I love the fact that you, because again, people could get diagnosed with that and then be like, well, that explains all my troubles and that explains why I can't be successful. And that explains, whereas you're looking at that going, that explains why I'm so awesome. That's why I'm able to focus on this. And that's. Well, now you might, you might get a different opinion from my wife. She might tell you that I've been driving her in the sale since the day and arm of that. <laughs> you, would do, you must be doing something, right? She's still there. Like... <laughs> okay, the two of us get on the best. But yeah, ADHD has been challenging in the marriage for, for all those years. You know, we have a different concept and a different perception of, of life sometimes from our yeah. from our partners, you know. So yeah, that's that's been that's been good fun over the years. But I think she would um I think she would say that that sort of going to get myself diagnosed and do all the, um, you know, she she was very very grateful that I did that I did go down that path of recognizing it, you know, because it was never diagnosed as a child. Yeah, well, but, where you when, when you were growing up, they didn't diagnose us with anything. Even I was a few years later at school, but I just got put out of it. They're like, troublemaker, get out. It wasn't a case yeah. of wonder what's going on with his him in general. So the, the fact just si since you brought it up and if you're happy enough to talk about it, what made you decide to go and test to find out? Like what was there a turning point in your life where you just thought, I must go find out if Well I have to say I have to say that um you know, I was always aware that there was stuff going on. Because um, our our family would would have quite a bit that um, maybe that was diagnosed in later years. You know, we all we we all 
well, quite a few of our families sort of have a touch of it. Christmas in our house was always great, Craig. <laughs> but uh, no, my wife would have been very influential. She's she's a, a she comes from a nursing background. She uh, comes from she comes from a psychology background. So she would always have uh, said, you know, Gary, you, you need to think about what's going on here. And she was a big part of it in helping me to bring me to the point where um, I, I looked into it and come to a place of acceptance, you know? Yeah, that's brilliant that, that you had that support around you. And now when you look back, like when you talk about your family Christmases, there was probably a few years where it was a nightmare. But now that you have a bit more of an explanation, you're looking back on, that was actually good crack now when you think about it. <laughs> It was never dull. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I just wanted to, to just investigate that a wee bit, just because I know there's going to be people watching it that have the same sort of thoughts and think, but they don't do anything about it. Again, everything that that I teach is about becoming better. So some ways you come better as you go and learn a new skill. Some ways you come better as you go find out what's going on with you. Like, why are you so self-sabotage you why do you stop things why do you not chase your dreams what is it so the fact that you've done like both we just went from one side of got instinct i'm doing it doing it to uh, going and getting checked and finding out and then the fact that you married them together to probably improve even more because obviously it hasn't slowed you down or stopped you in any way so you probably went well I, now that i know what this is i'm gonna use that to drive even further forward so I think a big part of it as well, Liam, is just, um, you, you know, the whole COVID situation has uh, been absolutely horrendous for people. Mm -hmm. Their businesses have been cut off. And, and I know that I was very, very distressed whenever Paddy's Day, 17th of March, we closed our doors. We closed yeah. the we closed before the, the it was mandatory. Yeah. Because I just thought of all the vulnerable people that were coming into my shop. And I was thinking about my staff, one of whom's my sister in law. She has diabetes. And it, it was just a real, it was a very, very stressful time. And we didn't know how we were going to, if anybody was going to throw us a lifeline. Mm -hmm. We didn't know at that stage about furlough or anything, you know? Yeah. But the whole COVID situation just has been very, very difficult for many, many people. My heart goes out to all the creatives, all the musicians, and they've been stopped performing. And, and I, feel, I feel for the kids that aren't able to have that social interaction, and, yeah. you know, the, the whole worry about all their studying and everything. But what I, what I have tried to do for myself to get me through COVID as best as possible, um, I tried learning a few new skills, graphic design skills. Cool. And uh, I, I was doing various Zoom meetings about social media networking and things like that, trying to improve my skills for the business. Yeah. But I was also trying to focus on all the positives in my life mm -hmm. ra rather than, than overly focusing on, on the negatives, which were pretty obvious. I wasn't able to open my doors. I yeah. wasn't able to continue my business. Um, I, I was cut off from all the social interaction with all my customers, which I find very, very difficult. But, um, you know, just trying to have a bit of mindfulness and trying to, just relax and deep breathe and just try to be in that moment where I was focusing on all the good things in my life, of which there are many. Yeah. And that, that has that has helped to get us to, you know, we're a year down the line now. And, and hopefully that might be helpful to somebody else that's that's maybe listening. Um, yeah. you know, try to get into a positive place where you can appreciate the things that that you actually have in life rather than all the things that we can't have at the moment so hopefully that might be of some assistance to somebody yeah i think that's brilliant that the the idea of because it's not like you're saying just avoid the negative and forget about it you're saying it's very obvious what's negative like 
for you, for example, you can't open your doors and you miss the interaction with the public and your customers and clients. A lot of people try to either shy away or hide from the, the negative and force their, themselves to be more positive, which isn't going to work. Eventually, you're going to get pulled back. But the fact that you're able to deal with it, like I would have been saying to people that instead of thinking about what you can't do, appreciate how much you miss those things and how much it's going to like for me it's the beach i love the beach and i'm oh, the, the, but you were smart enough to move near it I, i'm about an hour away from it <laughs> so so it's not far and i could have on a whim i would have drove to the beach and now i'm like instead of thinking oh i can't go to the beach it's terrible i just think about how amazing it's going to be the first day i step foot back on that beach it's going to be unreal so my my attitude to it is the things that you that you're missing and the people that i'm missing like i didn't realize how much i loved being on stage until i got a year of not being on a stage you know like that's actually i feel i live on this i'm for the stage i live there this the rest of it's not where i live and i'm like didn't know that i just sort of i didn't take it for granted but i just sort of went out and did as best i could and then came away from it but now so so i like that idea if you're not just you're not just trying to push the negative away as if it's not happening and looking away from it. You're looking dead at it and going, right, this is this and this needs to be done like this. And I also love the fact that you, like, it's obvious through this conversation that the love and care you have for your staff and for your people that come into your shop, that you would close earlier, not because you, like, it's stressful for a business owner to go, right, I need to shut the doors. And like you said, you didn't know about furlough, you didn't know anything. But what you did know was, it's safer for these guys if we do that. So, like, I love that as well. That you're you're thinking of everyone, not just just yourself. Uh, which sort of segues me into the more selfish reason that I asked you to jump on the podcast. <laughs> so I grew a beard. Anyone that's been watching me will I've been talking about it all the time. I feel inadequate beard wise now at the minute. <laughs> But, you've got beard. You've got beard envy, haven't you? That's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> Even I used to not like my wee greys, and now I see all of yours. I'm like, actually, that looks, it looks very distinguished. Whenever it's more, mine's like, like a, I'm aging, whereas you look distinguished. I don't like that. Uh, well, it's a funny old thing. It really is, Liam. I mean, I. Um, I grew a beard for the first time about five or possibly six years ago. And I know it sounds a bit dramatic, a bit melodramatic, but the beard actually changed my life. Yeah. Froze on cheese. Because was, uh, another long story. And yeah. I just, nobody, I love nobody you. looks at Sorry, Nobody you, looks you... at you stopped at, you froze at a beer changed my life. After you said it was very melodramatic, you literally froze after that statement. So I missed oh, everything. I missed everything after that. But it was quite, quite good timing because you talked about. So, you froze it. Got it. Okay. Well, I'll pick. Up. The beard changed the life because basically I was, I was contacted by uh, a PR company, a modeling agency. Uh, the girl that owns it, Kathy Martin was uh, my wife had had sort of dealings with her before. And she said to Mary one day, she said to my wife, that big lad of yours fancy doing a bit of modeling. Now, at that time, I was about 52 years old, Liam. And I thought, modeling? What, what do you mean modeling? But yeah, I've done uh, various modeling campaigns for the likes of TK Maxx and, and Bush Mills and various people. And once again, great crack. Yeah. Uh, you don't get a huge amount of money from it, but it gets your your image everywhere. When I yeah. when I, I did a, a all the billboards and all the you know and it's great it's great advertisement for the barbershop. You couldn't buy it for the brand. So the beard is the brand. I mean, if you look at the, yeah. where are we? if you look at the you know, so I can't actually I can't shave the beard off now. But that's okay, because at least everybody at least everybody likes it, and they're not all hounding me saying that's a terrible end thing. Get it off you. You've went. You've got beyond that. So I I think I'm about a, about two weeks beyond the. 
I think you should shave that stage. Up up until recently, people would look at me and go like family, and people that see me in, in the Zoom lives and stuff would go, "You not shaving?" As uh. if I had for, as if I had forgot. I'm like, no, I'm literally trying to grow a beard. Uh, so that one of my questions was going to be, when's the last time you actually saw your face? Because that's something that came up when I when I was trying to tidy it up. You would notice it's I'm bad at it, so I'm trying to grow it out to fix it again. But you're going to give me some tips, so it's going to be fine. But. Well, I- I give you a very, very simple tip. If you look at the uh, your jaw, your, you know your jawline here. Yeah. Where the hair now, my hair is well out of control. I I haven't had it cut since June because I've been here. Whenever the shop has been closed, I've had nobody to cut my hair, and whenever the shop's been open, I've been too busy to be able to get a haircut. So I'm okay with that. I've got it all tied back today, and a bit of a bit of a top knot. But where the hair meets the beard, you want a nice transition. That's that's important. You obviously shave yours, so you want to be able to blend in the sideburns with your yeah. your actual hair on your head. I and then, that. well, this bit here, you know, say you go for a, let's say you shave your head with a, a 0.5. Yeah. Would that be a bit right? About a, about a, a half a zero, something like that. So then the sideburns, if you had a zero on the hair, you might put a wee half just over the the beginning of the the, the sideburns, uh-huh. just so it's, it, it, it sort of fades in. But what I do is every morning, I shave to this line, and I also shave underneath to the line, because what they say is the general wisdom about such things is you don't need anything below the choke. So your choke would just be maybe half an inch or an inch above your Adam's apple. And that would be a good, you're pretty much on the money there. Yes. You're pretty much. <laughs> and that line, that line that is on, because what you don't want is for your beard hair and your chest hair to meet. Yeah. Not a good look. Not a good look. Not a that good was look. something I was curious about because I have random like neck hair and I was like, do I get rid? Do I have to with a jumper on? It's fine, but I was like, do I have to trim this too? How do? And then well, I like... would shave. I would just shave down to the. I don't know if you can see that or not. Yeah. You know, you don't want the hairs of the chest hair sticking up over the top of the t-shirt. You know, so. Cool. And then, I noticed on your on your website because, this is why I asked at the very start about about men being more open whenever they come to the barber and is it changed because. I'm I'm not the manliest of men in the world, but I have no grooming. All I know is you should definitely shower, wash everything, and then people are like, what what cream do you use? I'm like, what, what what do you what aftershave do you use? I'm like, what are you talking about? So, but I seen you have bams and things. What's so there's there's a, there's a, what's the plan for how do I make a beard more glorious? That's my question. <laughs> Well, the biggest complaint about beards is that I would get from people talking to me about beards. People say to me, oh, that itch, it's driving me mad. That would be the most common complaint about a beard. How do you grow that beard? Mine drives me mad. I'm I'm forever scratching it. And then what happens is you get like beard dandruff. Because essentially the skin underneath the beard has just got very dry. So yeah. whenever, whenever you, the dry skin would cause that irritation to make it itchy. So how you would combat that is you put a bit of moisture back into it to take away the dryness. So that there's where your beard balms and your beard oils come in. Your beard oils, they're very, very consecrate or concentrated. They would be made up of things like jojoba oil and, and various things like that that put the moisture back into your skin. So a couple of drops on your hands, we, we, uh, you, you might have a little pipette, just a couple of wee drops, rub it onto the hands and then massage it vigorously into your beard. Make sure you get right down to the bottom of it. Give it a good old massage. And what that does is that replaces moisture in the dry skin, which in turn takes away the irritation. And it gives your beard a nice shine and makes you know like a healthy a healthy shine to it yeah and uh you just comb that through bob's your uncle series around the balm would be 
essentially the same thing as the oil, but it's solid. Uh, and generally speaking, I would recommend a beard oil for maybe a shorter beard and a beard balm for a longer, a longer sort of a beard, you know. But they're essentially one and the same thing. But we do a sweet tobacco oil, which is our best seller. Guys just love it. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a manly sort of a scent. And the, their partners love it as well. It's, it's usually women that buy my products for their yeah, love. That, yeah, that's why I, think about, why I thought I would ask when I had you on, because it's my sisters and all who are going, do you not need to do something with it? But the oil. <laughs> And you'll, you'll be amazed if you get a decent oil. Now, I'm not saying you buy my oil. I'm not suggesting that. But I'm if just you, saying, if you were suggesting I bought your oil, where, where where would I get it? Where would this where does this oil can, reside? You can go on to our website. You can buy it. You can buy it off our Facebook page, and you can also go on to our Etsy page. If you just put in Gary's Barbershop, and remember, there's two R's in Gary's. It's just Gary's, G-A-R-R-Y-S, Barbershop. And if you go on the Etsy, or you'll be able to see all our different products that we do, and the T-shirts and the sweatshirts. And... But yeah, bit I'll of find it, and I'll link it all below. And then when I get it, I'll, I'll take a picture of me pipetting. Ah, pipetting. Good man. Let, let, me know how you, let me know how you get on with it as well, Liam. Yeah, because well, I, always, I always like positive feedback. Now, unfortunately, at the moment, I am out of stock of our sweet tobacco, and I'm also out of stock of our sandalwood, which is a very popular option as well. We're having a few problems getting our bits and pieces, obviously, with the whole Brexit carry-on and the whole COVID yeah. carry-on. So it's been a wee bit tricky, but I'm hopefully going to get all that resolved in the next couple of weeks. And hopefully, um, we, we do have, we also do a, a mint and pepper which is very refreshing, of nice, zesty, yeah. minty sort of flavour. And then we also do a citrus and narali. Narali, I had to Google it. Narali is like a burnt orange sort of a smell. So it, if you can imagine that burnt orange sort of, and citrus, the wee citrus edge to it. So they're lovely as well. So we'll have those in stock. So we'll get you sorted out. Brilliant. I, lo I look forward to being even more glorious. Yeah. Uh, and then what you do is, whenever you put it on, don't say anything to anybody and just see if you get any sort of reaction, yeah. either from people saying, oh, your beard looks nice and shiny, Liam, or alternatively going, oh, you, you smell good, you know, what's, what's, what's that you've got on you? <laughs> as long as they don't say for a change, you smell good for a change, <laughs> that, that, that it's all good. I'm uh, sure they wouldn't say that, <laughs> Guy, I, I know I've taken up a lot of your time. I, I really appreciate it. It's been a really fun call. I, I just loved having you on. And I look forward to tidying up my beard. Also, whenever this is all over, I'm going to come up and get you to shape it. I'm going to book in. And... So I'm trying to grow this bit back because I... I'll i tell you what I did. You've I didn't gone know through what... the water, haven't you? Yeah. Because I was watching a video on how to tidy up a beard. But I, I should have watched the video and then tidied up the beard. But I watched the video and tidied up the beard. So if you notice, this side's even worse. Uh, I would, yeah. Well, what I what I normally recommend to guys is, you know, come in, get the beard done. We have, we have beardy guys that come to us from literally all over Northern Ireland. Now, a lot of these guys have got beards down to here. You wouldn't be able to. You wouldn't be able to see my logo on some of these guys. The you could part them, and they're just a big fool. And some of their they're, they're almost down to their navel, you know. But these guys, you imagine they've been culturing this 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 beard for maybe three, four, five, six years. What is their worst nightmare? You cutting is it? Me cutting it all off. So you tend to find these guys suss you out on social media first and they might even send you little questions and you reply and you put their mind at rest. <coughs> and then once they come up, then they're generally grand. Uh, the, the sort of, my beard normally puts them at rest, puts them at I, ease. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, yeah. Normally, they'd say to me, who does your beard? And I go, well, I do my own beard. They go, ah, well, you'll do for me. You'll, you'll be all right. Yeah. But, uh, 
generally, what I would generally suggest to these guys is, you know, get their beards sort of lined up a bit. Get uh, the shape of your beard would very much be dependent upon the shape, your, your facial, your bone structure, you know, mm-hmm. your cheekbones and, you know, um, so get the general shape of the beard that you want. And once I've done that and tidied it up underneath for them and tidied the line, as I say, that, that blends in with their, their hair, their hairline, that is them. They can look after that for about three or four or five weeks. As I say, I shave every morning to the line on my beard. Mm-hmm. Where I, you see what you said that you've gone too low? Yeah. Well, once once it grows back, and once you get it to where you actually want it, anything above that is superfluous. Like you yeah. don't want, you know, those wee stray hairs that you get going uh, on on your, your cheekbones and all. Now you, you don't really need those. There, there's, there, there. So if you just get the, the level, the line that you want, and then shave above above it every morning, it takes about ten seconds. Yeah. And also. Once you've got the line underneath where you want it, you can shave all around here, which takes about 10 seconds if you're doing it every day, you know? Yeah. And that will that will generally, uh, that'll keep them going until maybe five, six sort of weeks. And then they're ready to come back again for a haircut and get the beard tidied up again, you know? Yeah. But yeah. You, can do the, you can do the day-to-day maintenance on it yourself and then get the proper tidy up Every time you come to, every time you go to your barber shop. Plus, because I, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking when I was getting you on about booking, and then we've had this conversation. Because I thought that's something I'm missing out. Is that I haven't had my hair cut since I was about twenty, so I've never been in a hairdresser's. And in my head, a barber shop is from <laughs> coming to America. That's my vi- vision of a barber shop where everyone's in and they're just having the crack and they're talking about. Like they were talking about boxing and coming to America, but just the interaction and the banter, I thought that's something that I miss out on by never and by people having their own beard and always doing it. I'm oh, sure I can do it myself. I'm like I bet there's professionals out there that could do go, more. Going to the barbers, you should always feel better after a visit to your barbers. You know? Physically, psychologically. If you're coming out if you're coming out of the barbers grump, like we've Get done a new something. barber. Yeah. We've done something wrong, you know. Our barber shop would be very eclectic. We've, uh, I mean, my sister in law that I mentioned to you earlier on there, she is originally from Thailand, but and she's tiny, she's only you know, I don't, I don't even know if she's five foot tall, she's she's maybe just shy, but she's tiny. But she, we pocket rockets, you know, we call her the child whisperer because she has this wonderful affinity with very young children, Brilliant. you know, she's just, she's just, she's incredible. I can't even begin to explain how incredible she is. There's sometimes myself and the rest of the staff just look at her and just, you almost just want to break out <laughs> and be around of applause, you know? But then we've got young Raphael that works for us, Rafa, and uh, he's originally from Portugal. But he started off his barbering career working in an Afro barber shop, which is a whole different skill set. Yeah. Doing Afro, doing Afro hair. And back when I was training, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to cut a lot of sort of people with Afro Caribbean sort of background. But he, Rafa is pretty. He's he's fabulous at doing the Afro hair, and he is. You know, like all the real cool high tops and everything. Aye. Uh-huh. Uh, he's he's superb at doing those and uh, all the fades you know he's brilliant at doing all the fades a lot of the younger sort of customers all would, would wait for rough so we all have our own different characters we all have our own different abilities Siobhan, Catherine um, and Samantha we, we all we all give something sort of different to our barbershop experience and the customers of course are are uh, they, they choose which barber they want to cut their hair. Yeah. So it's very, and that is, I, I very much encourage that. I think that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. If somebody's coming in and they are waiting for one of my members of staff in particular, I know that that member of staff is doing a really good job. Yeah. So, but yes, lots of different characters, lots of different 
and that's uh, that's pretty much what makes up that that special wee thing, you know. Uh, so it's you're not just going to get your hair cut; you're going for an experience. You're gonna yeah. the culture and the idea and the positivity and everything around you, and the fact that people wait. Like yeah. you, you, that's again what we were talking about marketing and branded and stuff earlier. You can't buy that either. Like you can't like if you came out, if I came in for the first time ever and there's someone in front of me and I said, "Oh, go on ahead there," and they're like, "No, no, I'm waiting on Rafa." You'd go, "He must be like they must be good if people are willing to sit." Because most people. Well, we just... actively we actively encourage our customers to to go for their chosen barber and not to be embarrassed in any way. Yeah, you know. Now it's a lot easier. It's an awful lot easier now because we're using a booking app. Oh uh, yeah. So people just choose whoever they want on the app, and that makes that that takes away any potential embarrassment. Yeah. But um, I've always actively encouraged it. You know, go to the person that you want to cut your hair, and don't feel uh, in any way that you're embarrassing anybody. And I, as I say, I actively and I actively encourage that. You know. And it's 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 working very well. It's brilliant. Well, I can't wait to get up. Uh, I'm gonna let you go. I really appreciate it. Uh, what is the best way for people to find you on social media? Just Gary's Barbershop on Facebook. Cool. I'll tag everything that I can find G-A-R-R. below as well. Two or G A double R Barbershop. I'll tag everything so or I'll link everything so everyone finds See, it easy. That's that's the other thing is as well, Liam, because we've got so much activity going on. Yeah. We've got so much sort of, we're having as much fun as we possibly can. And, you know, we're getting involved and and we would have the music in the shop. Uh, we would have different events. We've actually had, you know, the young buck, uh, young Jewel, the magician. Aye, uh, yeah. Jewel, Jewel M. Or Jewel M. Winning. Yeah. Jewel, he calls himself to play. Well, we had him in our shop perform for us for all the customers about two years ago. Yeah. You know, so we would have a lot of very vibrant stuff going on in shop all the time. And then every November, I always try to do an event to tie in with Movember to promote, cool. pos- to promote positive mental and physical health. Yeah. Uh, I decided to do it a couple of years ago. I invited the Belfast Giants to come to the shop. Oh, that's right, yeah. Because there was quite a few of them that were customers at the time. And I just thought that it would be coming at it, coming against the stereotype. Like these guys are fit. They're, they're healthy. They're athletes. They all earn a decent wage. They have a great lifestyle. What could they possibly have to worry about? What yeah. could they have possibly to be anxious about? They've got a great life and all the rest of it. So we invited them, and I didn't know how that was going to go, but they were very open and upfront about anxiety, and whenever they get injured, it's a big coat. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. A, and these athletes are sitting on their backsides. They're not doing all the training that they normally. They're worried maybe about losing their place in the team. And so there was a lot of really good stuff that we were talking about there. <clears throat> so then I thought it would make an annual event out of it. So the following year, I invited the Belfast chapter of the Harley Davidson Owners Club to come and hang out with us. And they all wrapped up on a Sunday morning. There was about 30 Harley Davidsons all sitting outside the barbershop. And once once again, coming against stereotypes, Mm -hmm. big, burly, tattooed guys that wore leather and with, you know, with big beards and, you know, these big, roughy, toughy sort of you know that cliche of the big the big rocker the big and there they are they're sitting talking about their positive men's health and so i've just been trying to break down a few stereotypes and uh we did the the last time we did it uh, last uh, last november in fact i didn't do it until, my goodness you lose track of times i actually did I, I did a personal one about myself Opening up about my ADHD, and I had the uh, I had the guys on from ADHD Northern Ireland, and yeah. sitting having a conducting an interview and an open discussion about it. So we do like to promote positive mental health and positive physical health, and we do like to to have a lot of other community stuff going on as well at, at any given time, and and uh, so 
where, where I was going with this is that we constantly have feedback from our social media. Yeah. It's very much it's very much a, a two way open open uh, line of communication. So, so the, the doors to the shop are closed, but the doors to the world are still open. That's that's correct. correct. That's Brilliant. pretty much it. Yep. Love it. Uh, Gary, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. And for everyone listening, I will link everything below so that you can find him, follow him, check him out, go get your beards checked out, grow a beard, and then by the time you have it, it'll be open, you'll be ready to go. And thanks for tuning in. Have an amazing time, whatever you get up to, and I will speak to you again soon. All right, Liam. Thank you very much indeed. Best of luck. Thank you.